This afternoon, I want to look at the theme of cosmic treason. I want to direct your attention to a text that I've preached from many times, including uh, in the series that I did years ago called The Holiness of God. And uh, I will be looking at this text from a little bit different perspective from how I treated it in that context, but nevertheless, there will be some uh, duplication if you've heard that before. But the way we learn things is by repetition, so uh, if you haven't learned it yet, maybe today you will. I'm going to be reading from the book of Leviticus, from chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. And I'm going to read until we get to verse 11. And again, if you won't mind, I'd ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. And then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron. And he said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever through your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. The God whom we worship today in spirit and in truth was the God who exercised this judgment that you have heard on the sons of Aaron. Let us be instructed by it. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Again, our Father, we come before you to be instructed by your sacred word which word has the power to cut between sinew and muscle, between bone and marrow, cutting through the calcium of our hearts, the stiffness of our necks, and the blindness of our eyes. In this hour, give us fresh understanding 
of the sinfulness of sin. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Though I've preached many times on this text from Leviticus 10, I have never been satisfied that I've been able to do it justice in one sitting. One of my favorite books that I commend to all of you and especially to those who are in the pastoral ministry is the book written by the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs entitled Gospel Worship. We have a crisis with worship today in the church, and so many of us seem to be floundering, wondering what it is that is pleasing to God in our worship. The best answer I've ever read to that question is found in that book, Gospel Worship by Jeremiah Burroughs, which the entire book is an exposition of the text that I just read to you a moment ago. Let's look back and rehearse the circumstances that are recorded for us here in Leviticus chapter 10. We're told that the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. They experimented with the worship of Israel. You know, yesterday when Dr. Ferguson talked about Scripture and how Scripture and the Word of God came in so many various forms, he included in that a statement that may have startled some of you when it was said, when he mentioned that some portions of Scripture even came by dictation. Because critics of orthodoxy in their view of the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture constantly accuse conservative people of believing in a dictation theory of inspiration, which I know of no orthodox theologian who has pled that case about the mode of the divine superintendence of the Word of God. In fact, the only time I know of where that term appears historically is in the fourth session of the Council of Trent, where in the Council of Trent, the fathers of Trent made passing reference to the Bible which came to us through the Holy Spirit dictante, dictating. But even there, it is not used in the manner that the biblical writers were reduced to automatons or amanuenses who took down each word as God uttered it from His throne, or was it His easy chair, <laughs> His lazy boy, His round table, oh, it was His throne, which He established where, Dr. Lawson? in the heavens. I just didn't want anybody to forget where that throne uh, was established. But the point is, is that there are portions of the Bible where God does dictate verbatim what He wants, and the place where that occurs more often than anything else is when He dictates what He commands for His worship. So the Lord God who has established His throne in the heavens is a jealous God, and it's the same God who dictated to Moses and to Aaron how He is to be worshiped that we worship today, and He cares as much today that we not offer Him profane worship than He did on that occasion 
in the history of Israel. Now, what really happened there to Nadab and Abihu? I've read some interesting theories that explain to us what actually took place on that occasion. I remember reviewing a curriculum that was offered by the Northern Presbyterian Church in the decade of the 60s for junior high and senior high students in an overview of the Old Testament, and they make specific reference to this text where they say, obviously, in light of the New Testament revelation of the love of God, we can't believe the historical accuracy as such occurrences as this sudden execution, this harsh and brutal treatment of the sons of Aaron, because we know that God is not really like that, and that this is simply one evidence of a pre-scientific, unsophisticated Hebrew uh, account of a natural disaster that they didn't understand, but obviously blamed it on God. Shades of Neo-Marcionism. You remember the heretic Marcion, who presented for us our first Bible in antiquity, but an expurgated version at that, when he went through the New Testament with a comb and deleted from the gospel references in the epistles all references to Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, because Marcion was convinced that, that the God of the Old Testament was not really God, but a demi-urge who had a demonic side to him, and it was that demi-urge from whom Jesus redeemed us and brought us to the true God, who is the God of love for centuries. People have struggled with the portrait of God that is unveiled for us in the Old Testament. And the two problems that create such difficulty in understanding the God revealed in the Old Testament is that we don't understand in the first instance what Dr. Lawson referred to yesterday as the Godness of God. And next to that, we don't understand at all the sinfulness of sin. And it is these two problems that constantly provide a barrier to our understanding of the things of God. We don't understand who God is, and we don't understand who we are because we cannot distinguish between the holy and the unholy, between the sacred and the profane. One of the most fascinating attempts to explain this particular incident in Israel's history with the sudden destruction of Nadab and Abihu came from the pen of Emmanuel Velikovsky. You may be familiar with his two popular works, one entitled Worlds in Collision and the other one Earth in Upheaval. Professor Velikovsky was a professor of geology and antiquities at Princeton University and was one of Albert Einstein's closest friends on the faculty there. And Velikovsky was convinced that the orthodox view of geology called uniformitarianism was mistaken and has left in its wake so many an anomalies that cannot be fit into the uniformitarian paradigm that he called for the philosophy of a second glance in geological theory. And his book, Earth and Upheaval, he cited almost an endless number of such anomalies, such as the 
discovery of undigested tropical food in the stomachs of mastodons that were found encrusted in the ice in the polar regions. Those mammoths must have been awful slow. They've been swallowed up by the glaciers before they digested their breakfast of plants that seem to come from the equator. And so, numbering anomalies like this over and over and over again, Velikovsky poked fun at uniformitarianism, but his other work, Worlds in Collision, was more imaginative. In this, he studied the mythology of ancient peoples, people from the North American continent, people from Africa, people from Asia, people from all over the world, and he found certain patterns of similarity in myths that had been handed down over generations in different cultural groups around the world. And he speculated in this manner. He said, usually myths emerge in cultural history as uneducated responses to real natural events that take place that people can't understand. And so they tell their stories in mythological categories. And so he said, what possible natural phenomena could explain so many of these myths that we find in the ancient world? And he came up with the idea that at one point in times past, they huge comet that would soon become a planet actually came so close to the Earth's surface that it caused catastrophic upheaval even to the point of reversing the poles of our planet, which reversal would have caused a sudden shift or stop in its rotation in one direction and making it stop and rotate in the other direction. And he said that would explain the story in the book of Joshua where Joshua saw the sun stand still. He also said this fiery comet that would spend some time in duration near the earth's surface would account for the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites following the tail of this comet, which appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of smoke or fire by night. And so he used this uh, imaginative catastrophic event to explain all kinds of passages in the Bible, not the least of which was the one I just read to you. He said, along with that cataclysmic turbulent upheaval, all kinds of gases were spewed and emitted from this comet passing so class by pouring uh, naphtha, gas, and petroleum into the Earth's surface, which seeped down through the crevices particularly in the oil-rich Mideast. And he said it would be natural that people in that day would find some of this bubbling crude and like Jeb Clampett, <laughs> take some home, taste it, try to cook with it. And these enterprising young priests said, hey, wonder what would happen if we put this with the incense and tried it out on the altar. And so they scooped up some of this natural gas, put it on the altar, and had the surprise of their life, indeed the end of their lives, as the stuff exploded and consumed them. Well, those are some of the explanations for what happened here. I put more confidence not in the speculations of curriculum designers in the PCUSA church or even in the imaginative speculations of Emanuel Velikovsky, as much respect as I have for him. I want to hear how God explains this story. I'm not the only one that, upon first reading of this, wanted an explanation. 
The person who was most insistent on finding an explanation for this disaster was the father of these two boys, Aaron. Aaron went to Moses, and if we read just a little bit between the lines here, we can imagine something of that conversation. I hear Aaron coming to Moses and saying, Moses, what's this all about? They're young. They like to try new things. All they were doing was experimenting a little bit with worship. They're trying to relate to their generation. (laughs) Trying to improve upon the Lord's principles of worship. He said, and God, without any warning, just like that wham, strikes them dead. Does my service in ministry mean nothing to God? Moses, you know I've stood next to you. I've been faithful to you. I've tried to be as devout as I can possibly be as a priest of the Most High God, and this is what I get? Well, maybe he didn't say any of that. But I can't imagine that he didn't. And Moses said to Aaron, don't miss this, please. Aaron, I suspect he prefaced it with words that aren't included. Aaron, you know, I know your heart's broken. I know you're paralyzed with grief. I know you can't understand why this tragedy has befallen you and your house, but Aaron, don't you remember what the Lord said? Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. If you're going to come into my presence, if you're going to serve in my name, if you're going to approach the altar of burnt sacrifice, if you're going to mount the stairs of my pulpit, I will be regarded as holy. And in front of all of the people, I want to make sure they're entertained. No. But before all the people, I must be glorified. I must be glorified. Not your innovative sons who are playing cute games on my altar. They're not respecting me, and they're not glorifying me in front of the people. You know, what I love about sacred Scripture is the way in which the Holy Spirit so often inspires understatement. The next statement is an understatement with a vengeance, for it reads, so Aaron held his peace. (laughs) God says, hey, I will be regarded as holy by anybody who comes near me. Do you remember that, Aaron? You bet Aaron held his peace. He held it as tightly as he possibly could because there was nothing left to be said. But God wasn't finished. Then Moses called Mishael 
and Elzaphan, the son of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come on over here, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary, and give them a proper burial in sacred ground. No. Get their charred corpses, and I want you to take these corpses outside the camp. The same place we send the scapegoat. Into that place that is the outer darkness, that place that is unclean. They didn't know the difference between what was clean and what wasn't clean, between what was holy and wasn't holy, and I want them out of here. I don't want just dead. And they were dead. I learned a new concept about that. This week I had lunch with the police chief of Lake Mary, and he was telling me a couple of gunfights he was in and talking about a call he had to a place where there was a corpse and rigor mortis had set in and the corpse was propped up against the door and the police had a very difficult time pushing the corpse from out of the way of the door so that they could get in. And he looked at me and he says, that man was DRT. I said, DRT? I've heard of DOA, dead on arrival. What's DRT? He said, DRT is dead right there. <laughs> That's Nadab and Abihu. They are DRT. They are dead right there. And Moses said, take them out of here. In the unclean place where the light of the countenance of God doesn't shine. And I don't want to catch anybody tearing their garments or engaged in mourning for these men. There will be no mourning for them. Don't you uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die and wrath come on all the people. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. Not nap the gas from a comet, but the burning that God Himself has kindled. And you don't go out of the door of the tabernacle lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did everything that Moses said. And then the Lord said, don't drink wine or toxic grain, drink you nor your sons with you, and so on. He said that you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy, and between unclean and clean. I'll never forget the first time I read the story of Uzzah in the Old Testament. Remember poor Uzzah? The Ark of the Covenant had been recaptured from the pagan hands of the Philistines and had been stored, and now it was time to return it to its rightful place. And David leads the parade, and he calls for the Ark to be transported on the back of an ox cart. And Uzzah, presumably a Kohathite, but we don't know that for sure. We do know that the Kohathites were that subdivision or that clan of the Levites who were specifically charged with the care of and transportation of the holy vessels of the tabernacle. And you know the story. As they're in this glorious procession of bringing back the throne of God, not the one that he has established in the heavens, Dr. Lawson, but the one that he had established on the earth in the Ark of the Covenant, he puts on the back of this ox cart, and as the procession is moving down the road, one of the oxen stumbled. And it looked as if, with the cart being unsteady, that this sacred vessel that came from the Holy of Holies 
was about to slide off this ox cart and fall into the mud along the road and be desecrated and be smirched by the dirt. Instinctively, reflexively, almost automatically, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark lest it fall into the mud. And a voice was heard from the clouds. Thank you, Azza. No, that's not the way the story goes. The same thing that happens to a, a Nadab and Abihu happens to Azza. God strikes him dead that instant. Well, of course, the writers of that Presbyterian curriculum had a field day with this as well. They said all of the Kohathites had been instructed from their youth that under no circumstances on heaven and earth were they ever allowed to touch that sacred vessel. There were rungs at the end of it where staves were pushed through so that it could be transported without even touching the ark, but rather touching the poles that carried the ark. And they all understood that the penalty for touching the ark was death. And so the framers of the curriculum say, well, obviously they knew that. And so when he instinctively reached out and touched the ark, he scared himself to death right there in the spot, <laughs> had a heart attack. But God wouldn't do anything like this to kill poor little Uzzah. Jonathan Edwards preaches on this text, and he said Uzzah's sin was the sin of unspeakable arrogance. He thought that his hand was less unclean than the mud. You see, there's nothing profane or unholy about mud. When dirt mixes with water, it becomes mud, just as God ordained in nature. The contaminant that would defile the throne of Yahweh wasn't the dirt on the ground, it was the hands on the sinner. But Uzzah was so presumptuous that he thought he could keep the ark holy when he was not holy. You see, Uzzah didn't know who God was. He didn't understand the godness of God, and he didn't understand the sinfulness of man. Back in the decade of the 60s, the Pex bad boy of the Roman Catholic Church, <coughs> Hans Küng, wrote a book in German called Rechtfertigung, or Justification which he gave a very lengthy treatise of his understanding of justification, trying to find points of agreement between classic Protestantism and Kung's understanding of the Roman view. Of course, he failed in that. Karl Barth wrote the forward to it, saying that if what you say is, in fact, that Roman Church's doctrine of justification I will go to St. Margaret Margarero and say, Fathers, I have sinned. I wouldn't because then Bart didn't get it right either. But in any case, in that book he had a lengthy excursus when he talked about incidents like this that occur in the Old Testament. The killing of Nadab and Abihu, the killing of Uzzah, the harem, the instituting of the slaughter of men, women, and children in the conquest of Canaan. 
the deluge of the flood that wipes off, wipes out everybody except the family of Noah. Fast forward to the New Testament, the sudden destruction of Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Ghost. And Kung said, how are we to understand these things? He said, at first blush, it seems like the God of the Old Testament is cruel, and He dispenses judgment that involves cruel and unusual punishment. If you look at the civil sanctions of the theocratic state of Israel in the Old Testament, you will see there are about 30 crimes that are listed as capital crimes consulting with a wizard or a necromancer, being engaged in homosexual sexual activity, these warranted the death penalty, public blasphemy. It was a reason to be put to death. Years ago, I saw an article in Time magazine that expressed outrage of an incident that took place in Baltimore, Maryland, when a truck driver was arrested for his unruly conduct, and he was abusive and profane with his resisting arrests and cursing out the arresting officers, and he was taken before the magistrate, and the magistrate wanted to throw the book at him, and the only thing he could find in there for disorderly conduct of this sort was 30 days in jail and a $100 fine. But he knew that there was still a statute on the books of Maryland that also provided with a 30-day sentence and a $100 fine for public blasphemy. And so the magistrate tacked that on to the man's punishment to the horror of the editors of Time Magazine, that anybody in this day and age could be sentenced to jail for 30 days simply for blaspheming in the name of God publicly. Oh, that that truck driver wished that he didn't live in ancient Israel because the ancient Jew would have given everything he had and done anything he could to have his sentence reduced to 30 days in prison and a hundred shekel fine for publicly blaspheming the name of God. But when we look at the Old Testament civil sanctions against the New Testament, where we're not in a theocracy, and it seems as if, Kong argues, that capital punishment has been reduced from some 30 crimes to basically one premeditated murder. And that seems like a tremendous contrast between the law of God as it's executed in the New Testament and how it was carried out in the Old Testament. And he said, but we overlook something. That by the time that God makes a covenant with the people of Israel, with Moses as its mediator, God has already radically, to an unimaginable degree, reduced the number of capital crimes for his people. And Kung said, have we forgotten? Creation? It's not the soul that creates public blasphemy shall be put to death. It's not the soul that consults necromancers and wizards who shall be put to death. It's not the priests who offer strange fire on the altar who should be put to death, but it is the soul who sins shall die. That originally all sin was a capital offense. Do you believe that? All sin, from gross and heinous crime to the smallest peccadillo, originally 
came under the death sentence of God. And at some point, if Christ does not, if Christ does not tarry, or if he does tarry, you will die. And I will die. As we are born DOA, we are born already under the death sentence of sin. Yes, I know the sting has been removed. But it's still appointed once for man to die. Because every sin is a capital sin. Why? You don't surely think that if I drive my car at 36 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour speed zone that that makes me worthy of being executed? Yeah, I do think that. Because the Lord God Omnipotent commands me to obey the civil magistrates. And when I disobey the civil magistrate, only slightly, I'm disobeying the Lord of glory, only slightly. But I am asserting my will over his, my knowledge as superior to his, making myself the judge as what is clean and what is unclean, rather than he making that declaration. Do you see that? The very first temptation. You shall be as God. We think of humanism being invented by the Greek thinker Protagoras with his motto, homo mensura, man the measure. Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. Man is the canon. Man is the standard of all that is right and all that is wrong. There is no higher standard than man himself. But you see, I challenge the historians who say that Protagoras was the founder of humanism. No, the founder of humanism was the serpent in the garden who brought his motto of homo mensura to Adam and Eve saying, you shall be as gods. You can set the standard. And the temptation in Eden was the temptation to be autonomous, to be a law unto ourself, so that everybody could do what was right in their own eyes, and fallen humanity will not have God in their thinking, will not have God to reign over them. And in the slightest peccadillo, our serpentine nature is made manifest as we declare our independence against God, and we revolt against His eternal right to impose obligations upon us and to say with finality, thou shalt or thou shalt not, when we say, I shalt if I feel like it. The nation of the United States of America is in deep, deep trouble, dear friends. The mantra of separation of state and church does not mean the division of labor anymore between two institutions ordained by God, one for redemptive purposes and one for common grace purposes of ordering society to protect, preserve, and maintain the sanctity of human life. No, 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 no. Now, on the lips of the politicians, separation of church and state means separation of the state and God. 
It's not the church that the politicians worry about, it's God. And our nation has declared its independence from God. I won't have him in the public square, I won't have him in the public school, I won't have him where anything that has to do with the state, if you want to worship him privately in your home or in your churches on a reservation like Indians, go ahead, we'll let you know for now. But we will not have God reign over this country. We've signed our death warrant. It's one thing to declare your independence from King George. It's another thing to declare it from the one who has established his throne in the heavens, who will not be mocked. But why are we blinded to the sinfulness of sin? Well, first of all, we don't know who God is, and so we don't know what the ultimate standard is. We can't distinguish between the holy and the unholy because we don't know the holy. That's why I beat that drum all the time about the holiness of God. That's why I take people back to Isaiah 6 all the time, because when Isaiah had that vision in the temple and he suddenly realized who God was for the first time in his life, he learned who Isaiah was. When he saw God in his exalted glory, he said, woe is me. I'm coming apart at the scene. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I've got a dirty mouth, and I realize it's not just me. I live in a whole culture of people with filthy mouths. For mine eyes have seen the King in His holiness. Calvin said it this way, as long as we keep our gaze on this world on the horizontal terrestrial level and judge ourselves by ourselves, we can come to a very optimistic view of who we are and we begin to flatter ourselves and consider ourselves only less than demigods But if for once we lift our gaze into heaven and consider what kind of being God is, we join the ranks of those in sacred scripture who were considered righteous men by their contemporaries, who having one glimpse of God were reduced to dust and ashes and trembled at the sight of him. Do you not tremble before God? Is there no fear of God in this world or in our churches? After that day in Israel, every priest that went to that altar who had seen what happened to Nadab and Abihu, they shook in their boots before they approached the presence of God. And the prophet said, let the priest weep between the porch and the altar. There's no time in my life, I say this to the pastors, where I'm more acutely conscious of my own helplessness than when I step into the pulpit to preach. Because I know as well as I know my own name. It's Sinclair, isn't it? I know as well as I know my own name, friends, that no matter how much time or energy I've put into the preparation of the sermon, no matter how much learning I've accumulated over the years, no matter what skills I've ever been able to gain and hone through decades of doing this, I know that all the rhetoric, all the eloquence, all the knowledge is pitiably impotent unless God the Holy Spirit is pleased to accompany the preaching of His Word. 
And so, like Luther, on the night before the Diet of Worms in his cell, on his face before God, he said, Oh God, send help. These hands are not clean. Your word is holy, but I'm not. I'm of the dirt. My feet are of clay, my frame is of the dust, and my help is in the name of the Lord. We need Christian leaders, men and women, who can distinguish between what is holy and what isn't, who will not engage in treason against the Lord God omnipotent. Edwards in his Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God said, you know, God is more angry at you than any prince has ever been at a rebel who dared to revolt against him in his kingdom. God loves you unconditionally? Find that in the Bible. I read where God says He abhors the evildoer. But because He withholds His judgment in His patience and His long suffering, we become at ease in Zion and think that the hammer will never fall when His patience and long-suffering is designed to lead us to repentance, it leads us to calloused hearts and stiffened necks, thinking, well, God will never judge us. It's because we don't know who He is, and we don't know who He is, who we are. If you learn anything this week, learn to think about the godness of God and the sinfulness of sin. If you understand those two at all, then you understand why there had to be a cross and why there is a gospel. Let's pray. Father, awaken our hearts and our minds to be sensitive to Your purity, Your perfection, Your greatness in all of Your attributes. Help us to see the sinfulness of our sin, that we may flee to the Savior and trade our ugly rags for the cloak of His righteousness. For we ask it in His name. Amen.